Amen. Amen. So as I said, I'm, I'm excited to be here, um, really excited. And this is a, a series that, you know, was, was birthed out of, out of Casey's heart uh, that she wanted us to do. And so we've picked it up and done it. And, and I felt like last week was a really good week. You know, we kicked it off, we started it, and we, we started to learn the difference between uh, behavioral modification and spiritual transformation. So the idea is that we all have a change that we want to make in our life, but we also all kind of feel powerless at times to make that change. You know, whether it be a big change, a small change, whether it be something, you know, as little as, you know, I don't know, like, uh, like trying to lose weight or something like that, or maybe something as big as paying off debt or uh, recovering from an addiction, whatever it is, we talked about how the power in the change is not in behavior modification, but in spiritual transformation. And I gave you guys some homework to do where you were going to go home and pray and ask God, okay, if, if behind every change there's a why, why should I change? And I wanted you to pray and ask God, what's the spiritual reason why you change? And if this is new to you, then go back next week or go back last week and, and watch that message. It's on our YouTube channel and on our, on our, uh, on our website. Um, but for those of you that were there and you did that, I hope that God spoke to you. And so this week we're going to be building on that. Every week's going to be building and building and building. And at the end of this six week period, I really believe that the change that you want to make, you're going to say, I am equipped with the power to make that change. And I hope that it's a life changing thing for you. So today's message focuses on this idea that we're going to stop the negative self talk. So th this negative self talk, I'm a pro at this. Now, last week, I feel like the message penetrated and got through to some of you, but maybe not all of you. And I don't know if that's because it's a hard one to soak in or if I didn't do a good job or, or whatever, but I don't think it got through to everybody. But, but what I hope is that this idea of stop the negative self-talk, I hope that just immediately penetrates 100% of you because everyone carries some self-talk and especially some negative self-talk you know, around with them every day. You know, we all have these thoughts, these feelings. You know, I should have done better here, could have done better there. You're not really worth it. You know, you're a bad husband, bad dad. You know, just this, this negativity. And we oftentimes feed it into ourselves. And so hopefully out of this message, what you're going to get out of this message and who this message is for, it's for those of us that we have a change we want to make. And a lot of times it's the, the negative self-talk, the way that we talk to ourselves internally that keeps us from making that change. And so today we're going to stop it. We're going to put an end to it. And so I'm going to walk you guys through this really cool journey of understanding where this comes from, and why we have power to actually make a change over this. So we're going to start by asking ourselves the question, what do you, what, why, not what, why, why do you do the things that you do? So why is it that you do the things that you do? Okay, so there, there's kind of, there's a funny side to this. I'll start with the humor of it. Uh, for those people that are, are newly married, you know, we've done some marriage counseling and, and we married some people last year. Um, I think this weekend is Tim and Sam Lawrence's anniversary, which we got to do their wedding. Uh, Thurlow, Robin Lee, you guys coming up soon. You know, I know there's a few people. But those first couple nights, or that first week or that first month, it's like you start to realize, why do you, you know, to your spouse, why do you do the things the way that you do? I mean, when Casey and I first got married, we realized, like, even just, we didn't even know how to sleep in the same bed together. Like, she liked the, cover, the covers untucked. I liked them tucked in. And it was, like, why do you do the things, why do, why do you do things like you do? You know, the, another thing that, 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 that I just am so thankful for a gracious wife, but I, I will just grab whatever toothbrush is in the bathroom and use it. <laughs> you know, it's like, so sue me. Casey doesn't know why I do that. I don't actually know why I do that. But because of that, we have like seven toothbrushes in the bathroom. I'm pretty sure that Casey keeps one tucked away. But, but I don't know why I do that. But I just, every morning, night, brush my teeth, just pick one out of the cup and use it. So th there are things in your life. Come on, you guys are all just as weird as I am. I know it. I know for a fact that you are. Everybody's got their weird quirky things that you could think like, why, why do I do that? Why does my spouse or my friend do that? Now, it, we can kind of like shift. I want to kind of shift you guys from, you know, the humor side of it to a slightly 
more serious side of it, you know, and it's, it's why, do you, why do you do the things that you do when it comes to, um, like, taking care of your finances? Why do you do the things that you do when it comes to taking care of even, like, your, your body and, like, your health? Why do you do the things that you do when it comes to, um, you know, even, like, waking up in the morning? What, who, who here is an early, early riser? Okay, hands. Okay, we've got some sick people in the room, so... <laughs> You know, you're an early riser. You, that, that's what you do. The alarm goes off. Your head pops off the pillow. I never could understand that. I, I get up early now, but I've had to condition myself to do it, and it's still hard. It's a gamble. I could set an alarm, zero guarantees, none. That alarm could just go and go and go, and my wife's the one that, that, that kicks me out of the bed, or she's already awake so she can hear it. There's people like her that the alarm happens, and your head just pops off the pillow, and you just get out of bed. I don't understand how you do that. So maybe you're a sleeper. Maybe you're, you're somebody that um, you know, is, is really great at being like charismatic and making friends, and, and you're really outgoing in social, cir- uh, social circumstances. But, but there's these things that... like. You've just kind of decided, like if we take the sleeping in example or the getting up late example, I'm a night owl. I can easily, easily get a second wind at 9.30 at night and stay up until midnight, 12.30, and then wake up in the morning, you know, a little bit later. But I try and get on Casey's schedule so I get up earlier and I go to bed, you know, earlier than I would normally like to. But, but. So what, what we say, what I said for years before I married Casey is this. I said, I'm just not a morning person. That's just not who I am. I, I, I am just a person that is a night owl. And so wh- whatever I'd like for you to think about, you know, how you wake up in the morning or, or whatever weird habit that you have, and think, okay, you know, I, this is just me. This is just how I am. And what's happening is when I'm saying that statement, I'm just not a morning person. Am I really just not a morning person? Or is that something that I have just subscribed to? Or something that I've just decided to be about myself? Or actually, what, what, as I started to think about this, I thought, you know what, actually, this is something that I have adopted. I've adopted the idea that I'm not a morning person because I don't think God made us and he separated us out and he said, morning, night, morning, night, morning, night. I think that, that you know, your, your living circumstances and the way you're brought up and who you're brought up around and even what country you're in. Uh, I know like when I've been in Mozambique, people go out to dinner at like 1030 at night and it's like, you know, that's wild. And, you know, so it's different, you know, a lot of different things that play into that. But I started to think about the things that I did. And I thought, why do I do that? Is it, is it because it's me? Or is it because that, that I've you know, like just kind of like fallen victim to it? Or is it something that I've actually adopted and said, you know what, I've settled on the fact that this is just who I am. And so what happens is, is, is if you take that, that, that simple situation and then you apply that thought process of I've just settled on this is who I am to different behaviors that you make, then what that starts to build up in you is it starts to build up your identity. And so then if we take behavior and we look at identity together, I can actually make this statement that, that it's our biggest driving force behind our behavior is our identity. So the biggest driving force behind your behavior is your identity. And your identity is something that you've sort of self-given yourself, you self ascribed to. So another way to think about this, and this is going to be kind of the, the key phrase for this message is, what do we do? Oh, go back one more, Josh. Sorry, it's my fault. We do what we do because of what we think of ourselves. So you do what you do because of how you think about you. Now, that statement is, is going to, we're going to say it again and again, and we're, it's going to make more sense as we go. But you do what you do because of how you think about you. How you think about you influences your behavior which then modifies your identity. See, we're going somewhere with this. Because if we talk about the change that we want to make, but we can't seem to figure out how to make, I'm trying to bring some pieces together for you guys that are how you think about yourself, your behavior, your identity. We're going to put all this together. 
and it's going to make sense to you. So before I move on, I've got a verse for you because I want you to know that all this stuff is not just a great, you know, this isn't a book I bought at the airport, you know, 10 things to do to get, <laughs> got Andy, 10 things to do to make yourself better. This is actually in the Bible. So I want to read you a verse out of Proverbs here. And it says in Proverbs uh, 23, 7, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. See, so it's as we think in our heart, then that becomes our identity. And I, I've just, I want to be honest with you guys. I've got this italic down here because this is the rest of the verse. I don't want to take the verse out of context and just pick a little bit of it and put it on the screen. I want you guys to at least have access to the full verse. And what he's talking about in Proverbs is this like, this guy that's not a great guy. And, and it's, a, it's a, like a king or a ruler, and they're not great, and they're two-faced, and, and they're manipulative. And so he's saying, okay, this is the manipulative bad part of it. But the verse starts with, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Meaning, your behavior, what goes in here, is always going to reflect as to what goes out there. So the, the key thing here is thinks, is what, do we, what we think about each other. And so that comes back around to the statement I said we're going to say over and over again. You do what you do because of the way that you think about you. So how do you think about yourself? You, you do what you do because of the way that you think about you. And Josh is going to throw that on the screen for us. How do you think about yourself? Do you think about yourself in a good way, in a bad way? What is it that's framing your identity? See, we're going to expose all that stuff in a minute, but I want you to go ahead and start letting that stuff sink in. Is that what you think about yourself is impact, impacting and influencing your behavior, which is creating in you your identity. So you do what you do because of the way that you think about you. Now, I hope that I say this phrase enough that you get sick of it, because then what's going to happen is on Wednesday, something's going to happen, and this phrase is going to pop into your mind, and hopefully it's going to help you to change the way that you think. So, when we think about the process of thinking, so I wanted to continue to kind of peel this banana or this orange open for you guys. When we think about the process of how we think, what's happening is subconsciously, we're asking ourselves in just milliseconds about three different questions. So for every decision that you make or every situation that you're in, most of us will go through three questions really quickly. So the first question is, what type of person am I? So something's happened. You've got to make a decision and you think to yourself, okay, what type of person am I? Am I a good person, an honest person? Am I a hard worker? Am I slack? Am I, you know, what type of person do you see yourself being? And the second question is, is what kind of situation is this? Is this a situation I can get out of that I can't get out of? A good situation? A bad situation? Am I in danger? Is this a celebration? But what kind of situation am I in here? And then the last one is, what does somebody like me do in a situation like this? So I, I'll give you two very recent examples to help you understand this, okay? So yesterday was the Weinberg Festival, and our son plays rugby and it's at Weinberg, and all of Cape Town was there, and so there was nowhere to park, you know, within a, uh, like a 10-kilometer range, and it was crazy. And we're in our, our, our van, the, the Honda H1 Masterpiece, you know, and I'm driving it, and this thing is huge, and we end up on a small road. There's a construction site where they're building a house, and we've got people behind us, people in front of us. Everyone's double parked on both sides of the road, and I'm trying to just inch kind of out of the way and kind of get over so somebody can go around. And I, I hit a car. I just heard the, the crumple in the back. And I was like, dang, put it in reverse. And I actually did say dang, for those of you that are wondering, didn't say anything else. <laughs> put it in reverse, reverse the car, you know, reverse the van back out. And eventually we, we got in and, and I looked at it. I said, okay, what type of person am I? Because I'm looking at what well, really was just paint damage on our car. And I'm looking at what is paint damage on the car that we hit with uh, license tags from somewhere else in the country. And I'm thinking, like, am I an honest person or a dishonest person? Do we just drive off, find a new parking spot? 
or do I stay and be honest? And I thought, what kind of situation is this? This is a situation that I can get away scotch-free. It's a situation with no accountability. It's a situation that is an accident and people are used to showing up and getting in their cars and finding that they've been dinged a little bit. What kind of situation was it? But what does someone like me do in a situation like this? So what I had to decide, and I mean, this was an easy decision for me. I had no moral like wrestling here with this. But, you know, Casey's changing, again, up very wet diapers in the back of the van. And we're, you know, the game's about to start. And I pull out a pen and a piece of paper, and I write my phone number and my name. And I put it under the windshield wiper and just said, hey, sorry, I'm the one that bumped your car. Got a call from him last night. Everything's sorted. Easy peasy. But that was an opportunity where I had to ask these three questions and make a decision based on that. Now, I'll give you uh, a place where I don't make the right decision. So, again, this involves the van. The van is the star character in this story. So the van, one day, Casey comes home, and Casey has also hit something with the van, and she's popped a piece of trim off of it, and she comes in, and she's, you know, like, something else was broken, and she says, oh, by the way, uh, while you're fixing things, here's, you know, a piece of, tr I've broken the, I've also broken the van, and I thought, what type of person am I? Am I a kind, loving, patient husband, or am I a frustrated jerk? I was a frustrated jerk. I just put my head down and just was frustrated with the situation that here we are, we had a broken car. What kind of situation was it? It was a situation where I could have chosen to show grace and love. And instead, I created a silent situation that made Casey feel bad. Now, what does someone like me do in a situation like this? The someone that I want to be like doesn't do what I did. The someone that I want to be like is actually who Casey was to me yesterday. Hey, it's okay. It's all right. Not a big deal. See, when we take our, our decisions and we filter them through these questions, we all come out with some kind of answer. And in fact, the way that we answer these three questions determines what kind of person that we are. The way that you answer these is going to dictate the kind of person you are. And then to take it a little bit further, it's it's the way that we answer these. It determines what kind of person that we are because, we go back to that phrase, what I think of me determines the kind of person that I am. So the thought process that you've taken determines kind of how you think about you because you're self-analyzing in every, in every situation, every decision. And so what you think of you is going to determine the person that you are. And, and this is true everywhere. We can't escape this because in every area of life, you do what you do because of what you think about you. See, you, you can't get away from this. In every single area, you do what you do because of the way that you think about you. So whether it's your marriage, whether it's work, whether it's business, whether it's your, your relationships with people, in, in every and any area, you do what you do because of what you think about you. So, Josh, put that on the screen for him here. Because this is so important for you guys to see. It's, it's just so important for you guys to begin to wrap your head around this. You can't escape it. So when it comes to wanting to change, you want to change a behavior. Where you're, you're trying to do behavior modification, but we're saying you need spiritual manipulation. Or you need spiritual transformation. So you can't escape this. It's everything you do happens because of what you think about you. Now, there is a way out of this, and it's a blessing. If we're talking about thinking and how we think about ourselves and everything that we do, we do because of the way that we think about us or the way you think about you. If you want to change you, then what needs to change for you to change? It's your thinking. See... If you think differently, then you can act differently. If you want to change what you do, then you change what you think about you. So what we're going to do today is we're actually going to change. We're going to try and change the way that we think about ourselves. So for everyone that maybe feels stuck, you're not stuck. There's a way out. 
Because we can change the way that we think about ourselves. There's power in that. And then the way, if you change that, it's going to change you. So we're going to dive into this topic right here because this is where really the battle is. And even when I was uh, preparing for this sermon, I was taking some notes on the side you know, for myself. And I, and I wrote on there like, this is the hard part. This for me is the really hard part. And the reason that it's hard is there's this phenomenon that we all kind of deal with and we all kind of are, are almost held prisoner or captive to is that when we think of who we are, you know, why is it easier for us to believe the bad things over the good things? See, someone can tell us, uh, you know, great things about ourselves and it's like, oh, you know, okay, thank you so much. But then the bad things that we hear, especially internally, we, we can't really, it's like, no, that, that takes first prize, that takes away. Why is it harder to believe the good things than it's harder uh, than it is to believe the bad things? Why is it that when you feel down, you feel bad about yourself, you've messed up over something, you know, and your spouse comes to you, your friend comes to you and says, hey man, it's, it's not a big deal, you're, you're great, you're an amazing person, you made a bit of a mistake, but hey, you're still fantastic. Well, you oftentimes don't feel fantastic. You still feel bad. You're believing the bad things and you're not believing the good things. So Jesus actually talks about this and he tells us why this is the case. And the reason that this is the case is because you've been fed lies your entire life. You have been behaviorally conditioned by the devil your entire life. From the day that you're born until even after you give your life to Jesus, that Satan still tries to get you. He still tries to get after you. And, and every day you wake up and you kind of have a battle between yourself, between Jesus, between yourself, between the devil, between good thoughts and bad thoughts. And when I talk about the, the devil, what I'm talking about is not a, a red guy with a pitchfork and a pointy tail. What I'm talking about is, is the, the opposite of God. It's the, it's the liar, it's the great liar, it's the great deceiver that wants you to always feel bad, that wants to trick you into never believing the good about you. And, and this is actually what, what Jesus says about the devil. He says, you are of your father, the devil. So what, actually what he's talking about is us. We are, are of our father, the devil. Because when we're born, we're born sinners. If we weren't born sinners, we wouldn't need Jesus. Everyone on earth needs Jesus. That's how we connect with God. So no one's excluded from this. So when we're born, we're born sinners. My three-year-old is learning how to lie, and no one's teaching him how to lie. He's born with it. It's in our, it's in our nature. It's in our DNA. So he says, you're the father. You are of your father, the devil. And it is your will to practice the desires which are characteristic of your father, meaning you sin and you do bad things. This is why when you're 13 and you're watching YouTube and there's a, a naked lady on the screen or something risque, you don't just shut it down and say, whoop, you can't watch that. No, you look over your shoulder, you see where mom and dad is, and you watch. <laughs> you know, that, that's because that it's, our, it's our will to practice the desires and characteristics of the Father. See, that's, that's deceitful. That's living in a sin. That's, that's covering up because we're ashamed. That's why you look to see where mom and dad is. You know, just like when Adam and Eve sinned, they covered themselves up because of shame, because of the sin. And so then he goes on to say about the devil, he was a murderer from the beginning. and He does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. So what this means for us is that anything that comes to you that's not from God or Jesus is a lie. Everything. Anything that you think about yourself, anything that you believe, anything that somebody tells you about yourself, anything that someone doubts you in, if something doesn't come directly from Jesus, if something doesn't come from God, then it's a lie. Period. There's no middle ground there. Because... There is either God or not God. And there's either God or the devil. And what Jesus is saying about him now is that in him there is no truth. That means everything he could say to you is an absolute lie. And so then the verse goes on here and it says that, it says that when he lies, he speaks what is natural to him. Because he's a natural born liar. For he is a liar and the father of lies and the father of half-truths. 
See, th- this is why we have a hard time believing the good in ourselves. Because we've got a whole life of being conditioned to never believe the good over the bad, but always believe the bad over the good. And then he goes on in verse 45 here and he says, But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me, and you continue in your unbelief. See, what this does is it just is an example of how Jesus is saying, you've got the devil that only tells you lies. But when I, Jesus, speak to you, you don't believe me. Why, why don't you believe me? Why do you continue in your unbelief? I'm the, the son of God. I'm light. I'm truth. I'm the side of this coin that's always for you. And you don't believe me, but you believe the, the king of lies, the deceiver. And, and, and this, again, it's in, our, it's in our nature. I don't want you to feel you know, condemned because of this. I've got a saying that I love to say. This is how I figure out. Is it from Jesus or is it from the devil? Is it from Jesus or is it from somebody else? Conviction will always bring you closer to God. Conviction is, I, I, I've sinned. Look, conviction is, is, I've been sober for, you know, for 25 years. And I found myself in a bar and I, I almost drank a beer. And in that moment, I felt so convicted and I just ran out of there. And when I got home, my conviction drew me closer to Jesus. Jesus, thank you so much for, for getting me out of that bar. Thank you, Father, for your grace. Thank you for your love. Jesus, I come to you completely emptied out and weak, and I'm not strong enough to do this on my own. But see, the other side of that is condemnation. Condemnation would say, you're a failure. You might as well go ahead and have the drink. Look how close you came this time. Hey, I bet you can get closer next time without crossing the line. Yeah, you know what? Just go ahead and have it. Because the idea that you'll go the rest of your life without this, it's crazy. Eventually you're going to drink, so you might as well go ahead and do it. So that, that's condemnation. You should feel bad about who you are, so therefore the behavior that made you feel bad, go do it even more. Condemnation takes you away from God. Conviction brings you to God. And what the devil is trying to do in this, what's happening with the king of the liar, is that he is actually attacking your identity. See, the, the devil is after your identity. He wants to attack it. Because see, the devil doesn't actually tell you that you did something bad. The devil tells you that you actually are bad. See, it, that's the difference between conviction and condemnation. Is that, is that the devil doesn't tell you when you've done something. He doesn't say like, you know, okay, you made this mistake. You did a bad thing. Now ask for forgiveness and, and take it to Jesus. No, what the devil does is, the devil says, you know what, you are what's bad. It's, it's actually you. And so what, what, what the devil wants to do and what happens with us, and I'm going to kind of explain this cycle to you guys here, is the devil wa- wants to sabotage your future. The devil wants to sabotage you. And the way that he sabotages you is through destructive behavior. So what he wants to do is he wants to, to, to increase the destructive behavior in you. He wants to use condemnation and he wants to use lies to you. That thing that you want to change that you feel like you can't change. You've got the devil that's saying, no, 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 let, let me get you into destructive behavior. Let me make sure that, that every time you drive by a, a liquor store that you feel like you've got to go in there. Let me make sure that every time you walk by your computer that, that you've just, you crave looking at pornography. Let me make sure that you can't put down that, that piece of cake or you can't uh, stop binge eating or whatever it is. Let me just make sure that you know that you're never going to be good enough for your spouse. And because you're never good enough for your spouse, then you might as well quit trying. See, that's destructive behavior. And the devil will tell us, don't try and do good because you're not good. You're actually bad. And so instead, it's that destructive behavior that sabotages us. And guess what? That destructive behavior that sabotages us, it, it goes on and, and it actually just uh, uh, creates this, this situation where we're doing these, these bad things. See, our, our destructive behavior, it sabotages us. And then our destructive behavior, it, it, it takes away from our identity. It changes our identity. And then what ends up happening is you've got this feedback loop to where the destructive behavior convinces you that you're not good enough. And then because you're not good enough, it feeds back into the destructive behavior. 
And then because you're, you know, destructive and your destructive behavior is, is sabotaging you, you do something wrong, you do the thing again, and you get stuck in this feedback loop. For some of you, I'm describing your marriage. For some of you, I'm describing your relationship with yourself. For some of you, I'm describing um, uh, a situation that you have like with a, with a family member or a friend. You know, we've been reminded this week, we've had some, some members of the church that are very near and dear to us that have been really, really sick this week. And, and as I was thinking about, man, what really matters in life, is, is it all this, you know, like destruction that matters? Is, is it these quarrels that we have with each other? How much time do I really need to spend just feeling guilty for nothing? How much time do I need to spend feeling shameful for no reason at all? I should, none, none. Because you've got Jesus who is saying, hey, I'm the truth and the life. I want you to listen to me. And if we could kind of remove ourselves from, from our, our own bodies, our own situations, and zoom back in and look at your life, I want you to see that you're probably in some kind of feedback loop of destruction, sabotaging you, creating a situation where you do more bad behavior, creates more destruction, and just goes around and around and around and around. And that's where most of us find ourselves a lot. And that's why when we think about change, we can't change. That's where the negative self-talk comes in. Because especially part of that feedback loop, you're never going to make it, you're never going to beat it, you're never going to be better than this, you're never going to be able to manage your temper, you're never going to be able to hold on, this is never going to work for you. And it's just over and over and over. And we've been dealing with this since we were born, since we can remember. So see, we're in a hard situation as as people because we sinned we messed up we're born with a sinful nature but we don't have to stay there we're not stuck there and we're not prisoner to that so if we take out the word de destructive we take that out and instead let's replace it with something in fact let me just randomly pick a word out of there christ-centered let's just go with christ-centered josh put the christ-centered uh, slide up here on the screen for everybody. So if you replace all that destructive behavior stuff and you then instead replace it with Christ-centeredness, a Christ-centered identity leads to Christ-honoring habits. See, before it was uh, a destructive identity leads to destructive habits. Destructive habits then lead to more destructive behavior. A Christ-centered identity leads to Christ-honoring habits. Christ-honoring habits reinforce a Christ-centered identity. To me, this sounds better. This sounds a bit happier. This sounds a bit more, more sorted, like there's more comfort in this. I can actually build my life and grow off of this. Even if I've never heard of Jesus, if, you, if you're not a, a Jesus believer, I just hope this looks more appealing because... You know, if anything, you don't have to walk around thinking bad thoughts about yourself all the time. This Christ honoring thing here, how do we do that? See, what, what is it that we do to catch that? What we have to do is instead of focusing on, instead of focusing on what I just said, instead of focusing on what to do, what I want us to focus on is who that you want to become. See, it, it's always start with who before do. This is the difference between behavioral modification and then spiritual transformation. Start with the who before the do. See, the behavior modification starts with the do, hoping to become the who. And that doesn't work. That's why there's so many failed diets and failed startups. That's why our, our, uh, our journaling habit that we wanted to start this year didn't you know, stick for a month. This is why the gym is super crowded in, the, in January and then come mid-February, there's nobody in it anymore. It's because people are trying to do in order to become a who. And what Jesus is saying is focus on who and then the do will come after that. Now, I've got a quote that I want to read you from a great book called Atomic Habits. And it says this, Every action you take is a vote for the type of person that you wish to, that you wish to become. So you, you've got two decisions to make. Whatever decision you make, it's a vote for who you want to become. No single instance will transform your beliefs, 
But as the votes build up, so does the evidence of your new identity. So I like to always uh, revolve everything around ice cream. And so no single scoop of ice cream is going to make me overweight. But it's the building up of the evidence of eating ice cream every single day that will show off my new identity, which is someone that loves ice cream. See, every decision that we make, we're voting. You know, l- last week, I wanted you guys to, to start with, with a spiritual why. Find out your spiritual why. Why do you want to change? Why do you feel like you need to change? What's the spiritual thing behind that? And this week, what I want you to think about is the spiritual who. And so you're going to seek God today for a new identity. And you seeking God today is going to come with you asking God, okay, who, who's the spiritual who? Who do I want to become? Who is it that I actually need to become? And see, Jesus has this wonderful life for us, and it's actually promised for us in a, in a verse that I want to read for you guys. And, and, and this verse is in Ephesians 4.21. This verse gives you permission to throw off your old self, throw off the, the inner self voice, throw off all that stuff, throw off the old who's, throw off the old do's, throw off all your past, everything, throw it off and get rid of it. Take every mistake that you've ever made and get rid of it. Take everything wrong you've ever done and get rid of it. But more importantly, take everything in your life that's outside of Jesus that is defining your identity and you get rid of it. And and this is what it says. It says, since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. So throw it off. You don't fold it up neatly and put it in your pocket. You throw it off and you get rid of it. And he goes on in the next verse and he says, Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. See, what, what that's telling us is that when you believe who God says that you are, then you get to start living in the plan and in the life that God has for you. See, God's got this amazing plan for you. You know what this looks like, what this looks like in you here? Th- what this looks like is, this looks like the young man uh, that has chosen purity. And, and he's, he's chosen not to look at pornography. And this man is now walking in freedom from that. He's not walking a prisoner to that. Th- this is what happens when you accept the truth of Jesus rather than the lies of the devil. Then you start to believe that you are the husband that you actually are. You are the wife that you actually are. You are the son of God that you actually are. And you take all that stuff that clogs you up and says that you're not. And you just throw it away. You get rid of it. See, in, in here in this moment that, that we're going to have as, as the band comes on stage to lead us in worship, I don't want everybody to imagine that you've got your own wheelie bin and, and it's right in front of you. And when they sing this worship song, I want you to, and you standing, I want you to imagine that wheelie bin in front of you, even if you need to put your, you know, hands on it. And I want you to imagine taking everything in you and asking yourself, did this come from God or not? And if it's a not, that goes in the wheelie bin. I want you to take everything that has been negative and everything destructive that's come from the liar, I want you to put it in the wheelie bin. I want you to throw it away. And instead, I want you to take on the new self that God has promised you. 